it seems like we're, you know, we're we're wagging our dog to try to, you know, get rid of this character Sherman, and we should be thinking about how it advances our story with the Turk. I mean, because the Turk is going to stay around. So. Well, that's why I thought. Like, like if the Turk, Turk is so off, but I think if we're centering it on, hey, let's just kill Sherman because oh. Shit. He's really well, inconvenient for the following him. That is, the is, pitch is, I mean, philosophically, I'm not against killing off Sherman at some point. I just think, like, episode 11 is, I think episode 11 is too early to do it. I think it overloads, I think it overloads the episode, and I think it's way too early to, to put blood on the Turk's hands, even yeah. accidental, even accidentally. At this point, I think it's just wrong, and I don't so what think... If, what, what if, if we surely did it? Yeah. Uh... Well, could be, but my question is why? Oftentimes conflict equals drama, and uh, we have our share of that, although <laughs> we try and, you know, we do our best to keep it respectful, and if we're on the attack, we are going after each other's ideas and not right. after each other as people. It's relatively egalitarian, like everybody has uh, a say, and that all starts with Josh. Josh is very interested in, in his characters and what they're gonna do and making them very, very unique. So once we kind of have the story, we talk about it kind of in general terms for a couple of days. And uh, usually the writer will go to the, one of the whiteboards and write down anything, any idea that kind of sticks. Uh, and then we send some uh, unfortunate soul or fortunate soul uh, off to write the first draft of that script. The writer goes off, writes the script. I do a set of notes on the script, um, which I give to Josh and then he does the final pass on the script. Every single script we do here runs through his computer. We have usually at that point a really strong structure. I rarely have to restructure things, but sometimes we were getting scripts pretty much probably 36 hours before we had to start prepping them. I would take that script and hole up in my room for two nights and rewrite it, uh, kind of, you know, making it all into the voice that I like. John is John's problem. Humans are the problem. There's only one way for him to be safe. That's to be alone. This season, one of the things we set out to do was to create some standalone episodes so that new viewers could watch our show and feel that they'd seen a complete episode. I know him. Well, unless you're about, oh, 110 years old. That photo's from 1920. See, December 31st, 1920. As the season progressed, we realized that, you know, there is a literary quality to the show. There's a novelistic quality to the show. In the television world, they call it being serialized. I look at it as literary because I, I feel that Josh has uh, poetry to his vision and, and to his writing. There's a bit of a life cycle to the whole to the whole process, and I think on a lot of shows that have a lot more standalone aspects, it's easier because you may have a writer come in and say, "I want to do, you know, this," or "I read this article about, you know, this," and maybe we should do an episode about this. And our show doesn't really work that way because it's so serialized. And I think even in the second season, where some people had a sense that it was more standalone. Uh, at least for the first part of the season, it really had to carry all these serialized elements and you could never ignore the mythology. So it's very difficult uh, for us to sort of send people off on independent study and come out, come back with five story ideas. It just doesn't work that way. So when it comes to deciding what we're gonna do, he's the final arbiter. It's all about what he wants to do. He sets the table for us. He tells us where we're going. Um, we have a lot of talented people on this writing staff, and everybody contributes, and everybody, you know, over time, it kind of sifts down. Everybody, it's like a family, dysfunctional family of brothers and sisters. There needs to be, and is on the show, a central vision, an aesthetic. You know, it's not just about what are our mythology beats. It's, it's how we tell the story, how we use language, how we use voiceover. Those kind of things need a very specific aesthetic, and Josh has that. For all of us, it's really been a very, we have mutual respect for each other, and we've sort of found a, a niche, you know? I mean, James spends almost all of his time on the set, or less, you know, and, and has really done a great job of kind of taking what he knows from me and the things that I, that are important to me in a performance, and, and 
found ways to communicate them to the directors and to the actors. So if you watch our episodes and you can go from 1 to 22, I think you'll have a real sense of this all has a feel to it. It feels of a whole. It feels like, you know, one thing rather than eight separate people's ideas of what the Sarah Connor universe is like. And that's the power of having a very strong creator with a vision. Any television show, by and large, it's falling in love with those characters and watching them struggle and change through time. And that's uh, the same for this show. I mean, this show just happens to have an action component to it and a scary robot component to it. But at the end of the day, it's a show about these family members trying to struggle against mortality. 